All right, congratulations, graduates um, and graduees. Um, is that right? There's all graduates, right? Uh, we're so proud of you guys. We have another, I think we have eight in the second service, eight or nine in the second service. So we have a lot of kids graduating and moving on with either their college or they're getting out of college, going to their career, they're going from high school to their career. And so we're praying for you. We love you. And can't we see what God does uh, in you and through you? And I think it's important that we um, we always keep them in our prayers, not just for this Sunday. This isn't a one and done. Like it's, we need to continually pray with them, for them. And uh, so uh, you'll use those Bibles. That's a he reads truth and she reads truth Bibles. And so we hope you guys will stick to those, highlight, make notes, uh, write in them. And uh, God will show you something through the scripture because it's important that we dig into his word. And so that's what I love about this series that we're in is we're digging straight into the word. Uh, we're actually looking in the book of Ephesians and uh, we're on chapter three this week. And um, next week we'll be on chapter, hey, not revelations as Stuart said in the second service last week. And so I'm excited about this series because um, we just get to get, we just really get to hear the heart, Paul's heart in this passage. And so I actually want to read, um, we're going to actually going to read about, uh, I don't know, about seven or eight verses here. I'm just, they won't be on the screen or anything. I'm just going to read them from the word. If you have your Bible open there in Ephesians chapter three, and I'm just going to start in verse 14, because that's all we've got time to cover today from 14 to 21. And, um, you know, Paul's writing this, before I get into it, Paul's writing this letter uh, from prison. So remember that. Remember how encouraging he is and building these people up and telling them how much God's going to bless and what God wants to do for them and how amazing God is, and he's doing it in prison. If you don't know, Paul actually would be handcuffed to a jailer at night to keep him from getting away, so it wasn't like he was just chilling and hanging out like prison today. Of course, I haven't been yet, but uh, <laughs> hey, hate speech is coming. Uh, I ain't speaking that over myself. What am I talking about? I'm telling, telling y'all to speak life and I'm over here speaking death. I'm never going to prison. Uh, they're never going to catch me. <laughs> hey, true story. I uh, have a couple of scars on my face. Um, I have one right above my eyebrow. I was playing basketball and me and a teammate went for the ball at the same time and I just split my wig wide open. Just, I mean, gashed it. And uh, didn't go to the doctor. My, my wife doctored me up. And so about five years later, I was playing flag football and same thing, I went to dive for a flag and got kicked in the face with some cleats in the same spot, opened it up. And one of the first things I thought was this. If I'm ever on the run from the law, they're going to identify me by this scar that I have on my face. That's, that's really what I was thinking. So, so anyway, uh, I haven't been to prison, not going plan on going to prison, but if I do, I'll be along with Paul because Paul was in prison writing these encouraging words to the people from prison. So remember that this morning that he was actually writing from prison. We're going to start in verse 14 of Ephesians chapter 3. And again, I'm going to read through and then we're going to dig into it. It says, when I think of all this, I fall to my knees. He's saying, look, I've been in prison because of what I'm doing, but don't, don't be discouraged. When I think of all this, I fall on my knees and I pray to the Father, the creator of everything in heaven and on earth, and I pray that from his glorious and limited resources, he will empower you with his inner strength through his spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts and you will trust him. Your roots will go down into God's love and keep you strong. And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep is his love. May you experience the love of Christ through through, uh, through it is uh, too great to understand fully. Though it is too great to understand fully, then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Now all glory to God who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we can might ask or think. Glory to him in the church and in Jesus Christ and in Jesus Christ through all generations forever and ever. What a powerful, powerful passage Paul is writing in chapter 3, and he's teaching us some things that I think we need to dig into today. And I, and I see three things. We're going to actually start in verse 12 because I want you to kind of see where Paul was coming from and why he was, uh, he was encouraged from a place of discouragement. And so I want you to see this this morning. Three things that I see. So the, the title of today's message, if I had a title, it would be Releasing the Power of God in Your Life. How to release the power of God in your life. Uh, Paul is very clear on how to do that here, in my opinion. So I want to show you that this morning. But I want you to see where he's coming from. Look at, look at verse 12, Ephesians 3, 12. Sorry, Chris, I tricked you. 
in him and through faith in him, we might approach God with freedom and confidence. Now, I'm sharing that NIV. I read NIV. It's a little confusing because I'm, I'm going to show you why I did that here in just a second. But he says, we can, we can approach the throne through freedom and confidence. I ask you, therefore, not to be discouraged because of my sufferings for you, which, you, which are your glory. And so what he's saying is, he said, look, I'm in prison, but this is good for you. He said, I'm, I'm paving the way for you. This is a good thing for you. Don't be discouraged because of what I'm going through. Because if I'm a disciple and I'm looking at Paul, I'm like, that's going to be my future? Like, I'm going to be in there too, Paul saying, no, just be encouraged by what's going on because God's doing something that you don't see. Look at verse 14. For this reason, I kneel before the Father. Why? Because I'm going through sufferings, but it's benefiting the church. It's about the bigger C church. It's about somebody else. I want to make sure that, that, that I'm, I'm pushing uh, the kingdom of God and not my own kingdom. Uh, I think sometimes we get sideways with that with kingdom work. We get sideways with that in the church. We get sideways with that with our own volunteerism. It may, we make it about us. And what he's saying is it's all about the glory. It's all about him. It's all about the kingdom work. Look at verse 15. He says, I kneel before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. And look at verse 16. This, this is where it gets good. It's been good, but it gets better. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit and in your inner being. He says, I want, I want, to, I want him to strengthen you in your inner being through his, through his spirit, because that's important. Your inner being is going to be strengthened. And then look at verse 17. This is where I want to dig in just for a minute this morning. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. He says, what, what Paul's saying is, I want Christ to dwell in your hearts. And, and it, it's not just that he has a place to stay. It's not just that he's there. It's that he feels at home. That's really what he's saying is that he feels at home in your heart. Does he feel at home in your life? Does he feel welcome in your life? Are you grieving the Holy Spirit by some things that you're saying, by some places that you're going, by some websites that you visit, by some jokes that you continue to share? Look, I like to laugh as much as any, anybody. And I hear some, some doozies that I cannot share again. And it's hard sometimes. It's hard to, to just keep your mouth shut. Don't say those words. Don't speak that death. What kind of attitude do you have? So my question is not, does he dwell in your life, but what kind of dwelling does he have? Does he feel at home? Uh, is, are you like that, that horrible Airbnb host that just the lock ain't ready for you? The code is wrong. There's ants on the bed. I've been to one of those before, by the way. And it's just a, oh, well, we'll, we'll get it next time. Those places don't last very long on Airbnb, by the way. But are you, are you that kind of host that just goes, I, I know that this is going to bother you, Jesus, but just, just turn your face just for a second. Just, just close your ears just for a second while I tell this quick joke. Just cl cover your eyes while I go to this website real quick. Not does Jesus dwell in your life, but how comfortable is he dwelling in your life? That's really the question that I have for you today, is what kind of life is, does he have in your life? Is he comfortable being with you? Is he comfortable? Listen, I, I think about it this way. If I was to bring Jesus everywhere I go, would he be happy? Would he be excited? Would he have to cover his eyes or cover his ears or, or turn his face? So Paul's saying here, he says, I, I want Christ to dwell in your hearts. But really the idea, the thought really is, is does he feel at home in your life? Uh, David, David had an awesome prayer uh, in, in the book of Psalms. And we all know David was absolutely perfect. David gives me hope. You know what I'm saying? But look at Psalms 139. Look at this prayer that, that David prayed. This is what I'm talking, this is what I'm getting to this morning. If you want to release the power of God, you got to get this. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. He said, I want you to test me. I want you to, to dig down deep. I want you to look at past places that I'm not seeing. I want you to see the blind spots that I have in my life. He says, search me and know my anxious thoughts. Uh, Y'all, I... Let me tell you real quick the difference between uh, being anxious and being fearful. Fearful is what's about to happen. All right? Fearful is like, hey, in the next 10 minutes, in the next week, tomorrow. Fear, fear is like really close. Anxious is what might happen. Anxious is down the road. Anxious is, is like, you know, it could happen, but I don't know if it will or not. Um, Y'all, sometimes I have prayers. I get anxious in my own prayers. Two nights ago, I, prayed, I had this dream. I dreamed that my son-in-law, Luke, he has a brother named Matt, so it's Matthew, Mark, and Luke. That's really their names. They're the, they're, they call them the, the three Gospels. 
So, so Matt, who's the oldest, I dreamed that he got a, a car, like a nice suburban, like futuristic looking, you know, low to the ground, all decked out, just smooth, clean. I can see it in my mind right now, gold and white. And it was just this really smooth car. And I got in with him to go for a ride and we, and, and we, we started to crank the vehicle and he didn't have any keys. And he reached down, this is all in a dream, he reached down by his leg right here, it was tied to his pants, it was hooked to his pants, it's like a little gadget, and he pushed it and the car started. And everything that he did, everything that he did to that vehicle came from that little gadget, this is all in my dream. And I remember thinking, what happens if he forgets to take it off of his pants and he puts it in the washing machine? <laughs> I was anxious in my own dream. That's how bad it is. I really was. I was just like, is this thing machine washable? Y'all, I, I can create unicorns in my mind and my dreams. I can go anywhere I want to go, do anything I want to do, and I'm worried about a little gadget getting washed in the washing machine. That's anxious thoughts. And so that's in my dream. And so we all have them. I have them. You have them. We all have them. He said, I want you to search me and know me and test me and see if I have anxious thoughts. And he says this, point out anything, 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 this is David's prayer, point out anything in me that offends you. Whoo, Lord, what a prayer for him to pray. Point out anything that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. Look, David didn't have it all together. He was a murderer, he was an adulterer. But, he was, but here's the second thing I want you to tell you, tell you about this morning, about this prayer. He didn't just pray the prayer. Can you imagine David saying, okay, Lord, show me anything that offends you. And the Lord says, okay, man, you got prideful thoughts. And David just going, yeah, I'll deal with that later. No, he prayed this prayer so that he would deal with the things that God led him to. Y'all, we have to make sure that, that, that the Holy Spirit is welcome in our life. And to do that, you might need to pray a prayer like this. Point out anything that offends you, Lord. Can you imagine if the church prayed that prayer, Shane? Imagine if the church prayed that prayer every day, just at your house, not just here, but at your house. If you prayed that prayer, Lord, point out anything that's not of you. Point out anything that might offend you in my life. And then do something about it. Three things that I think if we want to release the power of God in our life, we have to do. Here's number one. You got to get it this morning. That is host the spirit of God well. Not just host him. Not just do you know Jesus, but does he feel at home in your life? Does he feel welcome? Are you a good host to the Holy Spirit? What kind of life are you live? What kind of websites are you going to? What kind of thoughts are you having? What kind of friends are you surround yourself with? Your circle matters, y'all. Your circle absolutely matters. Host the Spirit of God well in your life. And, and, and look, there's, there's different levels. Like you, get, you get the Holy Spirit when you get saved, but there's another level that comes after that. It's being filled with the Holy Spirit. In fact, Ephesians 5.18 says this, don't be drunk with wine because it will ruin your life. Can I get an amen on that? Instead, here's the other option, be filled with the Holy Spirit. And the way that's written is be being filled. It's a continual thing. It's every day. It's not just today and, and this day next month. It's every single day. Be being filled. And it's another level after you get saved, you get the Holy Spirit because th there's actually stories in the Bible that Christians didn't know about being filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, it's just ignorance. Uh, look, at, look, look at this in Acts 19.1. Uh, it says, while Apollos went to Corinth, Paul traveled through the interior regions until he reached Ephesus, on the coast where he found several, everybody say it together, found several believers. You know what a believer is? A person that believes in Jesus. These are believers. These aren't somebody that hadn't been converted yet. They were believers. And look at this. He says this, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? He asked them, no, they replied, we haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. There's another level. And maybe you've gotten the spirit, you got the spirit when you got saved. Obviously you did, that's what saves you, he seals you. But there's another level. You can be filled with the Holy Spirit, but when you are, make sure that you are a good host. And here's how you be filled with the Holy Spirit. Y'all ready for this? It's so deep, so heavy. Uh, you gotta go to school to get this, but I'm gonna give it to you right here. Say, Lord, fill me with the Holy Spirit. That's how you say, Lord, just fill me. I want you to fill me. Nothing crazy has to happen. You don't have to take off running. You don't have to dance a dance. You don't have to cut a rug. You say, Lord, fill me with your Holy Spirit. And when he does, make sure that you're a good host to him because it matters. The Spirit gives us power. Look at this verse in Luke 24. And now I'll send the Holy Spirit just as my Father promised, but stay here in the city until the Holy Spirit comes and fills you with power from on high. There's another level, y'all. But I'm telling you, you got to be a good host. He ain't going to fill a dirty vessel. He ain't gonna, he, here's another thing. He can't fill a vessel that's already full. 
What is your vessel full of? What are you full of? Kids? Job? Hobbies? Maybe it's a stronghold of pride or control or lust or bitterness or religion. He won't fill something that's already full. So ask him to come into your life, fill you with his spirit. And I'm going to tell you this morning, be a good host. Say, Lord, show me. In fact, I pray that prayer first. Say, Lord, show me anything that offends you. And when he shows you, deal with it. And then say, Lord, fill me with your spirit. It's very important. Let's make sure that we are hosting the spirit of God well. Here's the second thing I'll tell you this morning. This came up in prayer this morning at 830. Everybody's invited. Here's number two. Love the people of God well. Host the spirit of God well. Love the people of God well. And I'm going to tell you right now, WRC does this real good. Anybody been on the good end of a, of a, yeah, Eric's like, yes, amen. You're the only one, Eric. Nobody else believes it. No, we love, I'm telling you, I've never been in a church so full of love for each other. It's crazy. Uh, and so we, we love the people of God well. I'm going to challenge you with that this morning. Love the people of God well. Love them, not just love them, love them well. Let's, let's look back at our passage this morning, Ephesians 2. Let's go to 3.17. Uh, the first half of it says this, I pray that you being rooted and established in love. Now, rooted means obviously rooted to the roots to go down, to grab a hold of. But then established really has the idea of a foundation. So he says, I want you to be rooted in love, but I also want you to have a foundation for you to build on. The roots go down, the foundation builds a strong a platform for you to build on top of. And he says, I pray that you be rooted and established in agape love, unconditional love. And look at this that you may have the power together with all the Lord's people to grasp how wide, how long, how high, and how deep is the love of Christ. So I, you, I pray that you may have this all together, all the people together to understand it. Here's what I want to tell you this morning. The NLT version, the reason I read it to you and then I'm sharing NIV is this. NLT says, I pray that you'd understand that God's love, that you grasp God's love. But it doesn't say that in the original language. Several translations say it. NIV doesn't put it in there. The reason is because I believe he's talking about, I submit to you today, that I believe that he's talking about love for one another. That you may love one another. That you may have the power together with all the Lord's people to grasp. I'm going to go back one verse. Look at that. Let's look at that again, Chris. Look at, look at 17b one more time. So I pray that you're being rooted and established in love. It doesn't say God's love. NLT says God's love. Other translations say God's love. Several say, don't say that at all. And so I, I, I'm telling you today, I believe what he's saying is not just your love, but your love for one another inside the church. I'm going to tell you, there is nothing like a church that loves each other. There just ain't nothing like it. I've been around. I know there ain't nothing like a church that loves one another. They love going to life group. Man, they love bringing people supper. I love to receive people supper when they bring in. People just pop in and I, somebody made me a fishing pole last week. Like legit, Britain made me a legit fishing pole. Three weeks later, brought Amy one with her name on it. So my wife has two fishing poles now. She's going to confiscate mine. They just, just love. I, just, I love a group of people that love each other. There ain't nothing like it. So it doesn't say anything about being established in God's love. I think he's talking about love for one another because the next verse, we just read it, but the next verse says that you may have the power together with all the Lord's people. So I think he's talking about our love for one another, that we'd be rooted and grounded in that to grasp how long, how wide, how long, how high, how deep is love of Christ. I don't have time to get into that. God's love is so deep. God's love is so pure. God's love is so long, so high. It, it, I'm, I just can't even put it into words, but he says you're not even going to grasp it unless you're with, together with people. You know why? Because you by yourself can't experience God's love. Because he loves people through people. God loves people through people. So you can't experience the depth of God's love all by yourself. And I'm going I'm to challenge anybody that says, well, I don't have to go to church to, to love Jesus. No, you don't. But you have to go to church to follow him. Because God is about his people. And you can't love his people from a distance. And, and I've had people come up and say, well, I don't really go to I just watch it online. Well, if you're an invalid, you can't get out. That's one thing. But choosing not to be around God's people is not a healthy thing to do because this is how we grasp God's love. You can't fully grasp the love of God if you're not around God's people. You just can't do it. Love God's people well. Uh, look at verse 19. It says, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge. I love this. This is crazy. He says, I want you to know something that's un unknowable. I want you to, to know something that you can't even know. Uh, that's, that's a crazy thought to me. Paul said, it's so good. You need to know it, but you just can't know it. I would describe it to you, but it's indescribable. That's what he's saying. He says, I want, it's just, I want you to try to grasp it, but you ain't going to be able to because it's just so good. It's so deep. He says, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge. Well, how are you going to know it if it surpasses knowledge? 
That's just how good it is. You're going to try to know it, but you can't even fully wrap your mind around it. That you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. That's how we get a hold of what God wants to do in our life. Love is so important. John has a powerful, powerful passage about this, about this, this uh, topic. Look at this, John 13, 34 and 35. So now I'm giving you a new commandment. This is he speaking to the disciples. This is crazy. This ain't a new commandment. Loving each other is not a new commandment. That you love each other, here's the new part, just as I've loved you. Up to that point, he just said love one another. Now he says, I want you to love them like I've loved you. You know what he's saying? I want you to be willing to go die for somebody. There's no greater love than this than a man laid down his life for his friend. He says, love each other just as I've loved you. You should also love each other. And then look at the next verse. This, is just, this should wreck you right here. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you're my disciples. Anybody that comes to me and says that they, know, they know and they love and they follow Jesus and they don't show love to the people of God, I struggle with that right there. Because he says right here, you want to prove that you love God, then make sure you go love God's people. The world is looking for proof of God. I'm going to tell you right now, it's getting worse and worse and worse. They are deconstructing the word of God right now. Do you want to prove to them that God exists? Go love God's people. You want to prove that God exists? Go love God's people with unconditional agape love. He said that you're going to prove to the world that you're my disciples by the way you love. Not the world, not those that hate you, by the way you love one another. And sadly, let me just tell you today, sadly, the church has not done a great job of loving one another. I've been around, I've been in ministry my whole life. My whole life. My dad pastored, for, he was my pastor for three decades, and then I went into ministry. I've been in ministry my whole life. And I can tell you right now, the church has not done a great job of loving one another. But here it's different. It's just different. It's different. And the world looks at the people of God, fighting amongst the people of God, and they say, I don't want that. There are churches right now in the, in the, in the spotlight fighting one another publicly. And, and God's saying, I, just love each other. Do they, should there be some correction? Absolutely. But he didn't say you're going to show the world that you love each other about how well you correct one another. He says how well you love one another. Love God's people well. It's, I'm going to tell you, it'll release the power of God in your life. Here's, here's the last thing I want to give you this morning. That is, seek the will of God well. Not just seek the will of God, but seek it well. Um, because you can take God's will and go try to turn it around and make it what you want it to be. Seek God's will, the will of God, well. And I, want, I, want to, I say well because I, you need to do it the right way, uh, with the right motives, because it absolutely matters. Let's go back to our passage, look at verse 20. It says, now to him who is able to measure more than we ask or imagine. So him who is able to do immeasurably more. You can't even measure what he wants to do. Then we ask or think according to his power that is at work within us. So it's according to his power at work within us. And people misquote this all the time and say, man, God can do anything we want. No, he can, he's able. He's able to, but it's according to the power at work within you. You want to know why God's not answering some prayers in your life right now? It could be that his work is not, his power is not at work in your life right now. You haven't been digging into his word. You haven't been locked into a group of people who love him and love you and, and just building you up. And, and you haven't been loving other people well within, inside your community. You haven't been doing well at work because you get frustrated and angry so fast. It's according to his power at work within you. Not his power, but his power at work within you. So that could be the problem to your situation that you have right now is that you're praying for some things that he's able to do, but it's according to his power that's at work within us. And that's so, so important to get. James chapter four, verse two, and this is the first part of this verse says this. He says, you want what you do not have, so you scheme and kill to get it. You are jealous of what others have, but you can't get it, so you fight and wage war and take it away from them. He says, you can't get what you want, so you just go fight it, go take it. You just decide just to, just to put everything to the side and go grab it. Creating issues and problems and a wake of dead people along the way. He says, you want what you do not have, so you scheme and kill to get it. And then look at this. You don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. And, and I'm guilty of this sometimes. I, look, I'll be sick for three weeks and I'll finally go, okay, Lord, can you just heal me? Why wasn't the first, that the first thing I prayed? Because sometimes it's the last thing that we do. He says, you're not even asking God for it. God wants you to do something in your life. It's the last thing you pray for. And I have had so many circumstances in my life where I prayed for something that I hadn't been praying for for two weeks and then all of a sudden it happens. It's a, it's a bill that, that we couldn't pay and 
Uh, we had a situation not long ago where we had some, some medical debt that was pretty big, big for us. And we just prayed, we just prayed about it. I said, Lord, this is in your, we give it to you. Now we've been struggling and complaining and whining and what is this? And looking at a list of things they were building us for. And like, well, I can't believe they built us for that. And I can't believe, and just getting mad. I mean, the more I looked at medical bills, the matter I got. Anybody been there? And finally, I just said, Lord, this is, I'm just going to give this bill to you. It won't hold up in court, but it felt, made me feel better. I said, Lord, this is, I'm giving, we don't, I don't know what to do. Made a phone call to a good friend who gave us some advice. Made a phone call to the doctor's office that billed us and said, hey, look, here's what, here's what you're billing us. Here's what we can do. The person that we were supposed to talk to who's not a very nice person at all because we know this person uh, on, a per, on a professional level was supposed to be there that day and she wasn't there. Another person answered the phone, cool as a cucumber. Basically just said, yeah, we'll take it. We said we're on our way. We cut a check right then and brought that check. And the Lord, what if we'd have prayed the first time? Instead of spending weeks, I'm telling you, I would just get mad. I'd be laying in bed at night trying to sleep thinking about this thing that they bought, billed us $475 for and I could have went to Walmart and got it for $3. Don't do that, but I'm not giving you things to do. I'm just telling you, that was a, I should have did it. I did it though. But I finally prayed and said, Lord, just, will you just take care of this? We don't have because we don't ask. You got to ask him. And then he says this, look at this. He goes a little deeper, he says this. And even when you do ask, you don't get it because your motives are all wrong. And you only want, to, you only want it to give you pleasure. He says you don't ask, but when you do ask, you're asking with the wrong motives. So my challenge for you this morning is seek the will of God well. When I say well, I mean, God, what do you want in my life and how's it going to bring you glory? Not how's it going to make my life easier. Paul never prayed that. Paul never said, Lord, I just, I can't go to prison again. He was like, hey, lock me up. I got some books to write. But we get so hung up on our own motives and how it's going to make our life better. If you will seek the, God, the will of God well, and when, I'm, when I say well, I mean, let's make sure it's for his glory and for his honor. It'll change the way you pray. But you have to do it. You have to do it. Seek his face. Ask him. Seek the will of God, but do it well. Do it with the right motive. And then the very last verse in our passage, we've been reading in verse 21, it says this. It says, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Paul closes it with this thought. He says, I want Christ to be glorified. He says, I want the glory to be in the church and Jesus Christ throughout all generations. See, see, Paul was not living a momentary lifestyle. He was living an eternal lifestyle. That's why prison didn't matter to him because he knew he was going to be in glory one day. He knew that one day it was all going to be over. He wanted to spend everything that he had to make sure that he glorified and honored the Father. I can't remember who said it. My dad could probably tell it. I'm going to give the quote and then he'll tell us who said it. All right. This is what they said. This is a powerful, powerful uh, statement. I think, Lord, show me who said that. Okay, it's not coming to me. Okay, D.L. Moody maybe. Anyway, he said this. This is what he said. He said, if I have a dime to my name when I pass away, count me a thief. Count me a thief. If I have a dime left to my name, count me a thief. What if we had that mentality? That's what Paul, Paul had the mentality. He's like, lock me up. I got stuff to do. I got some things to write. I need to, I need, I can actually, you know, his mindset was, his mindset was, you know what? I can actually encourage them better from here. When you pray and ask God for something, make sure it's with a pure motive. Make sure it's with the right heart behind it because it matters. Seek the will of God well. Love the people of God well. I challenge you to do that. I challenge you to host the spirit of God well. Get your life cleaned up. Love God's people well, and then seek the will of God well. And when you do those things, you release the power of God in your life. And you can seriously say, make this statement that I want God's Lord to be through all generation, from generation to generation to generation. Listen, in 100 years, somebody else is going to be living in your house and driving your car. Well, your car may not exist, but they're going to have your stuff driving your, in your house. What's going to matter in 100 years? Nothing. Only what we did for the kingdom, that's all that matters. That's all that matters. Let's honor and glorify him with what we say and do and where we go and how we act and seek his face for the right motives and watch what he does in our life.